at the rate we're going, it will take more than 250 years to close the gap, according to the World Economic Forum. And this isn't only a social issue, it's also an economic issue. Closing the wage gap could add $2.1 trillion to the U.S. economy. Just from an organizational standpoint, there's research that shows that, you know, when you have organizations that have higher uh, numbers of women in executive positions, they financially outperform their counterparts. And that gap is, um, on a yearly basis, is increasing. And so if we think about the trajectory of the future and we look at um, what's going to set the highest, uh, you know, organizations apart in terms of not only financial benefit, but also top talent, and sustainability, I think we, it, it's, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. It seems absolutely ludicrous for anyone to say, oh, we don't need to focus on this. And oftentimes companies are so worried about the immediate reaction of discovering and unpacking that disastrous pay gap that they're so afraid to even look. And I think it is so important for leaders and as humans to to like dis, de, detach ourselves from the shame and pain and I'm a bad person and we're a bad company to shoot, we're finding this, we know we're conditioned and we're gonna be responsible to do something about it. I think that that exercise is so important because we can't, we have to move past the, but we're gonna get sued. We have to move past the, like, people are gonna be angry at us and quit and know that long-term, the impact that you're going to have is gonna be much bigger than the immediate reaction. I do have a worry that we will see an amplification of caregiver stereotyping, of employers making all sorts of assumptions about women who have care needs and and that shifting their ability to get hired in the first place, their ability to get promoted or to get that, that opportunity that makes the difference between you moving up or not, not based on anything um, at all, except for their perception that mothers do less. We already had that perception before the pandemic and this last year with our care infrastructure crumbling makes the bias all, all the more uh, potent. We just talk about flexibility, but I actually think predictability is the justice issue. Because if you think about the people on the frontline workers, they don't just need flexibility, right? They need predictability of schedules. And that has been missing for a really long time and it doesn't allow people to have any psychological safety. It doesn't allow people to uh, make any money um, when you are getting penalized and especially, and you can't hire caregivers, right? If there's not predictability because you have to know when you're gonna be working, if you're gonna also be taking care of children. So I think it's really important as a justice issue that we think about as leaders, not just flexibility as a women's issue, but predictability and flexibility as a workplace issue that's available to everyone. The wage gap gets created over time over your career. It starts when you get hired at a lower wage at the beginning because of the hiring practices are wrong. It grows when you are unable to meet the expectations of the ideal worker because you've got demands at home. You don't have predictable scheduling. You don't have an ability to have paid leave. And then it grows even wider when you get to the top of the scale because you've been unable to meet the ideal worker expectations. So you don't get promoted. So what we're proposing in this paper is let's shift the paradigm. Let's start talking about ideal workplaces. What do we want our workplaces to be structured as that will get the most out of all of our employees, that will make everybody productive?